<clears throat> Hello there. I'm trying this one more time. And as I said before, this was something that I'm doing because I'm going to be doing a live stream tonight about the new book that's coming out with me and 28 other writers. But I figure, hey, if I'm going live, if I'm putting this on YouTube anyway, I might as well figure out a way to take advantage of that and talk about a book that I've been wanting to talk about. And this is one that I've recorded about three times now. Three times I've recorded about this book. And for some reason, each and every time something has happened. Either I wasn't able to finish it, and then I had to start over because I was so far away from what I had done, or I had a catastrophic hard drive failure that caused me to lose the video. And yeah, so it's just, I've recorded about this a lot, and now I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna plow right through it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna talk about The Wandering by Roger Elwood. And why do I want to talk about The Wandering by Roger Elwood? And why do I want to ask, is it worth reading? Well, the question is a question I've been asking myself for a long time now. I read this book in high school back in the late 80s, early 90s. And the reason I read it was because it was one of those books that was written by a guy who was published by Crossway Books. Now, Crossway Books, that was the publisher that published This Present Darkness. They published a lot of Stephen Lawhead's early books. And they also published a series because of This Present Darkness called Angel Walk. And because of Angel Walk, I had my eye out for books by the guy who wrote Angel Walk, Roger Elwood. Now, Roger Elwood, uh, is he's been involved in Christian uh, fiction and science fiction and that kind of thing for a long time. But on the science fiction side of things, he's been involved in creating anthologies and a lot of anthologies. I have a couple anthologies by him that I got when I realized who he was. And then I found an old, well, I did an unboxing of an of a eBay purchase I made of a book that I had checked out from the library when I was in junior high, and it was edited by Roger Elwood. And so I'm like, well, that's, that's interesting. And then I had this anthology that I had in college and that I wasn't paying any attention to this, but this is an anthology here called Continuum, and it's four volumes of stories each volume has a story by the same writers. And so it's, Anne McCaffrey has, a, has four different stories in one continuity. Paul Anderson, same thing. Uh, and Gene Wolfe. And so they have like all these writers wrote four different stories, one in a cycle. And so you're supposed to be able to read it without reading the other ones, but it definitely does continue from one to the next, hence the name, Continuum. This is a fantastic, fantastic anthology. And I love the gimmick behind it. And I'll be talking more about anthologies tonight, obviously. But uh, yeah, so the other thing about Roger Elwood is I actually then have met Roger Elwood. And he became the writer in residence at the college where my wife and I worked. And so that's why I picked this up again. So in high school, I read it and had it on my shelf all through high school, all through college. And then when I got married and moved into our own home, we moved around. And I had it on my shelf. And when I met him again, I tried to read it again. And I, I couldn't. I, I just couldn't get into it. Same thing when I was, um, uh, after that, after a, long, a while after that, I, I tried picking it up again and again. And I think I tried reading this four times uh, since meeting him. And I just couldn't get myself to finish it. And then I started doing the series of Christian science fiction books and asking, is it worth reading? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to find this book. The problem was, at some point in our most recent move here in the last couple of years, we moved here, I think, three years ago now, I don't know where this book ended up. And so I just couldn't find it, and I obviously then couldn't read it. But one day, one day, fate stepped in. And I went to it Better Price Books or whatever. I don't remember what it's called. It's the Half Price Books. That's what it is. I went to Half Price Books. I'm walking through their Christian fiction section where I'm trying to keep an eye out for Christian science fiction. And there, right next to a copy of Angel Walk, was The Wandering, which I was so excited. So I picked it up. I brought it home. I read it. And now I'm willing to talk about, is it worth reading? So here's the deal. <laughs> this is a very interesting book. But it was also not the greatest of books. <laughs> so I hesitate to say that. Roger Elwood is a writer and an anthologist that I, I respect him. And getting to know him, it was nice to get to know him a little bit. I went out to eat with him a couple different times. Um, 
went to Red Lobster with him, went to Papa Vino's with him and, and just was able to talk about writing and that sort of thing. And then had some phone calls with him and then had some more face to face time with him on campus at the college. And so I I hate to say it. I, I will say this. His Angel Walk series is a very good series about guardian angels and kind of. Well, it, one of them uh, is all about Jesus's guardian angel during the Gospels and uh, kind of all of the, the tensions that he had as he was going through all the different things that were happening and ultimately allowing him to to be put to death. And another one is about a fallen angel. It's called <laughs> Fallen Angel. <laughs> And it's about a, a demon who's kind of struggling with what they've got going on. Angel Walk itself is about an angel who is a little disillusioned by watching what's happening on the earth. And he goes on uh, a walkabout on earth and he goes around and he's, he's looking at different things and experiencing different parts of the world. And then Roger also did three different or no, two Harlequin Angel Walk books, which actually were pretty good. I remember one of the things that he actually specifically asked me to read of his was his two Harlequin Angel Walk books that were, you know, sped, you know published by that romance publisher. And uh, listen, he said, they say this is too ro too much of a romance to be a Christian book and too much of a Christian book to be a... And I don't know exactly who they was, but I read them. I liked them. I liked them. They're pretty good. So at any rate, uh, here's the deal with The Wandering. And what I like about The Wandering is that it is a science fiction novel that is... It harkens back to an earlier time when there's just a lot of imagination there. And there wasn't... I mean, this is when you say science fiction, this is a Star Trek science fiction kind of a thing where there is some scientific plausibility. Uh, and I'm talking original series here more than more than the others, maybe the others, too. There's some scientific plausibility, but the worlds that they go to, you kind of scratch your ha head and say, well, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but then... It, it's just a strange book in the sense that it's called the wandering because the guy who ends up being the main character is wandering the galaxy, uh, but he doesn't do much wandering in the first half of the book. And in fact, he's not a wandering spaceship guy, you know, on, on a mission to find strange new worlds. He's a tech detective, which means he's solving crimes in this kind of dystopian world. And the, the crimes he's trying to solve are the hunchback murders. And somehow his dead wife is connected to this whole thing. And it's just this kind of weird thing. And I, I'm not going to get into all the details that I got into when I was actually recording these originally. And there's a lot of details that I got into. But um, it just... It, the whole thing is about this investigation. And as he's investigating in this world, he's learning about another world. He's learning about these people who are keeping the, the scripture, quote unquote, alive and who are part of a, an underground. And it, it makes sense. It works. It, it's just interesting because half of the book is taking place on this one world. And he's where he's trying to unravel this conspiracy. And once he unravels the conspiracy and things come to a head, he, he doesn't win the day. Instead, he gets put on a spaceship and sent out into space by the bad guys. And as he gets sent out into space, th this is where he then starts visiting other worlds and experiencing these kind of metaphorical, allegorical uh, worlds and how people view uh, spirituality and, and, and so kind of different worldviews in that way. And so, but that's, that, that's half the book. I mean, part one of the book is pages one through 166 part two starts here at 167 but then there's there's part three and part four is right here part four is only what 20 pages long if that and so the i mean part one is the bulk of the book is half of the book where he's doing this investigation and learning about the natasians yes the Natasians. There are some things in this book that are coded, but not coded very well, or not coded very with very much difficulty. <laughs> uh, there's a world that he lands on where the people they they are led by a guy named jo Joseph Smith. Smythe. Um, yeah, Joseph Smith. Uh, there's a character named Matu. Uh, who's there's Matthew? Uh, there, there's a world called Snowdatus, which is um, uh, 
Satan backwards, the notations of Satan backwards. Uh, the other weird thing about this book is there's these footnotes that explain technology. And so I am going to kind of open up and read one of these here. It says here, he took out a beam pistol. And then there's a, a footnote to uh, so you don't have to interrupt the sentence with what a beam pistol is. He took out a beam pistol holding it in his right hand. But then the footnotes after beam pistol says shaped like an elongated egg. It had a button on top and one end was flattened when fired by thumb action on the button. A laser beam emanated from the flat portion. The criminal dead before hitting the ground if hit in the heart or the temple. And I'm just thinking to myself, this is something that needs to be shown, not told, probably. I feel like footnotes in fiction, unless you're Douglas Adams or Terry Pratchett or Neil Gaiman, uh, and you're intentionally trying to be you know, a little bit silly, maybe, you don't want to use footnotes. Uh, another footnote was on page 53, just the next page over. Then he noticed sticking out of a side pocket in Cortuck's outer garment, a port glow Footnote essentially a nuclear powered flashlight with a striking range of penetration. The only problem was that its energy lasted for less than two hours before it had to be recharged. And again, I'm just thinking, are these details that we need to have there? And I, I don't know exactly what the thinking process was that, that went into that. And then there was another, another thing here, which um, there's a scene and I, I don't have the page number here. Yeah, I do have the page number. It's page 109 and 110. You see, part of this book is that there's a framing device where you have a storyteller who's telling the story. And it just every once in a while, the storyteller interrupts and he's telling a story to children. And, uh, you know, spoiler alert, but it turns out the storyteller is actually the, the main character and he he lived all of this. That's how he knows the story. Now, I'm not going to spoil where he is, who he's talking to exactly and, and how he got there. But um, but you kind of know that's what's going on from the beginning. There's a portion here, it's a two-page chapter where the storyteller lets out a big sigh, time for a break, no, no, please go on, we're confused. And so he then talks about an entire story beat that really should have been maybe three chapters long, a very interesting conflict that was happening that the main character was actually like coming up with a computer virus and he explains what the computer virus is he explains how a computer virus works and and it works it actually works the attack that he creates with this computer virus works but you get it in a two page actually one page because look here chapter 12 it starts halfway down the page and it ends halfway down the page one page of exposition covers all this really what to me would have been very interesting information about this computer virus attack that the main character does against the bad guys and it works and then uh he gets uh he gets banished away from his people you know and he's he's on the run and and then it ends the chapter with what then what happens to him next he awakens in an unknown location he gets knocked unconscious goes on he, he he does the attack goes on the run gets knocked unconscious and wakes up and it all happens in this one page i have no idea how that happened what the editor was thinking when he said yes that's okay good enough uh, I just, I just don't get it. And there's also, like I said, with the Natasians, there, there's some cliched stuff going on here. Um, there is some interesting things where, you know, leading up to some of the cl cliche, but one of the things that they do is that uh, to capital punishment is actually you have to do battle with an Android and doing battle with the Android. No one has ever won until the book here. And then when the criminal wins, he, uh, well, he doesn't quite win, but it's it's complicated. Actually, it's not that complicated, but more complicated than one or two sentences that I could do right here. Anyway, there's an explosion where the people who are watching this battle are, you know, the, the wall gets broken down and the criminal comes through and he interacts with the main character. And he somehow the criminal knows when he looks at the main character, you're different. You're different. And, and we know, too, now that, that that our guy, he's he's the one. You know, he, he's been chosen for this. He's been chosen to be the wanderer. Then there is this very 
I don't know if it's interesting or unfortunate <laughs> thing at the end, but uh, he, so part one is a technological hedonistic dystopian society. Part two is his space travels as he's traveling from planet to planet and there's just desolation everywhere. Part three, it kind of gets into uh, this Jehovah's Witness uh, allegory and it talks about salvation of works and, and that sort of thing. Part four is Earth's Christianity. He actually makes it to Earth and there's a character named Matthew that he interacts with and and then he interacts with neo-Nazis. It's just this kind of record scratching moment for me. Like, what, what? where are we going with this book? Uh, but the book is about the fallen nature of the, the galaxy, of, of the universe. It's, it's about the fall. It's about um, being reconnected with God. And, 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 and it does that well, you know, but the question is, is it worth reading? If you are interested in trying to find a book from, let's see, I can't remember if it was the late 80s or if the early 90s that was published. Uh, it looks like it was 1990, so both, I guess. But if you're looking for, you know, a kind of old school Christian sci-fi book, then this is a good bet for you if you really want that old school feel. Um, and if if you're just looking for something, you know, historical sci-fi Christian stuff, then then this is a good one to pick up. And, and if you're just looking for a sampler of, of Roger Elwood, because he's, I mean, he is, I don't know if I would call him a giant in, in Christian fiction, but he is a big name or was a big name, a very big name in, in Christian fiction and a big name in science fiction. Now, some people said he put out so many anthologies that he actually watered it down for the rest of the world and made it more difficult for people because his anthologies weren't great because he was just accepting anyone and everyone. Um, I don't know how true that is. That's things I've read after the fact, and I, but it's things that I read from the time after the fact. So I'm reading it after the fact. It was written at the time. You know what I mean. Um, is it worth reading? I'd say, yeah, sure, sure. Is it something you need to really just rush out there and try and find on eBay or whatever? No, no. Am I glad I reread it? Yes, I am very glad that I reread it. I'm very, very glad that I reread it. And I'm glad that I pushed myself forward through it because, yeah, is it worth reading? more or less. But I, I mean, it's, it's one of those where, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. Oh, I got to think about it. <laughs> you know, if it has to be a binary thing, which means it may not be the greatest. So anyway, all that said, uh, really, if you're looking for something where Roger L would read Angel Walk, it's a much better read. And then you have a whole series you can go through if you'd like to. So that's that. Uh, I don't know when next time will be, but until next time, Thank you so much for spending time with me, and I just pray that you are having just a great holiday season as we are getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And I just dated this video, but you know what? If you're watching this next February, you can still celebrate the birth of Jesus. I mean, it's an important event in the history of the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, until next time, whatever that means for me and you, but until next time, I want to wish you Godspeed.